Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and I'm the current president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. I know it is a lovely evening, and I'm sure there are other things you could very enjoyably be doing, but thank you for coming here. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Royal Society of Edinburgh, it's Scotland's National Academy. In our fellowship, we have the intellectual elite of Scotland, leaders of business, practicing artists, community leaders of all sorts. And it makes for a very powerful organization with a fantastic spread of talent. The senior prize that we're award awarding this evening is both a medal and a lecture, but we'll start with the medal. It's named the RSE Sir James Black Prize Medal. It's being presented to Professor Ian McInnes, named after Sir James Black, Scottish doctor and pharmacologist, 1924 to 2010. And we're delighted to welcome his widow, Professor Rona, Rona Mackey Black, who is in the audience this evening. So I've lost her, but uh, wherever you are, Rona, hiding halfway back. You're very welcome. The medal is awarded to Professor Ian McInnes for his outstanding contribution to the field of immunology through his work in establishing the Glasgow Discovery Centre, which aims to create better medicines for patients. And could I ask Dr McInnes, Professor McInnes, to come forward for his medal? So the, the lecture this evening, you will have guessed, is to be delivered by Professor Ian McInnes. He's a Professor of Experimental Medicine and Director of Research Institute Immunology at the University of Glasgow. Professor McInnes's research interests focus on the mechanisms of inflammatory synovitis in arthritis, and he leads a translational program encompassing basic cellular immunology through to clinical intervention. He serves on the Medical Research Council's Panel for Training and Fellowships, is Director of the Medical Research Council's Scottish Clinical Pharmacology and Pathology Programme, it has an abbreviation you'll be pleased to hear, <laughs> SCP3, and is Deputy Director of the Wellcome Trust Scottish Translational Medicine and Therapeutics Initiative, which is also abbreviated STMTI. So would you please welcome Professor McInnes to develop to deliver his lecture. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving up what may turn out to be the entire Scottish summer on my <laughs> behalf this evening. It is indeed, uh, it, it's an honour and an absolute privilege and actually to spend some time with Rona as well, who was one of my sort of mentors and, and role models some years ago when she was at that stage working in Glasgow. So very nice to have that connection coming back tonight. So these are very interesting lectures to put together. I'm aware that there is such a range of expertise in the room that I shall be wrong in almost everybody's eyes by the end of the next 40 minutes or so. Um, including, I have to say, two or three of my own learned colleagues in Glasgow who have accompanied me uh, to make sure that I turned up on time and in possession of enough on buttons on the computer to actually make things work. Um, I, I'm notoriously bad with pointers and, uh, and computers, so I'm going to touch as few buttons on the computer as I can. Um, so the, when one is um, privileged with such a lecture, it behoves us to do a little bit of reading, and so I did. And I found... This very interesting quotation coming from the original Nobel citation for Sir James. Um, and this was, I believe, learned from John Stevenson, his chemist, as he's described in ICI. And the quotation, you can read it, but I shall, just to help my Glasgow friends out who don't read so well, you understand, <laughs> um, how, how to be more than merely curious about a molecule with an interesting biological effect how to ask questions about it. 
he converted me to pharmacology. Now, right up until about here, I could definitely empathize, but I have to say I was not ever converted to pharmacology. Instead, I became a rheumatologist, and uh, I'm going to develop a theme today about the questions that rheumatology has fostered in me. And uh, I, I started actually reflecting and pondering on curiosity, which, um, as those scholars in the room of the humanities and arts will be very well aware, has its origins in, in the old French curios, or the Latin curiosus, meaning careful, that from the, the same derivation as care. And this, I think, at the very outset, reflects what the original physicians had in mind when they thought about care and curiosity, that the two should be intimately linked. And the concepts actually that we have nowadays, that you can be a physician without doing research, or for that matter, uh, a researcher of the, of the medical conditions of humanity and, and animal kind, but not then be impelled to care, is actually to me anathema. And therefore, from the very outset, I want you to understand how important asking questions is to me. I'm still a practicing rheumatologist. I see patients in Glasgow Royal Infirmary a couple of times a week whenever they're kind enough to let me in. The patients, I mean, because it's a very interesting place, the Royal Infirmary in the east end of Glasgow. You navigate some very interesting geographical loci, for example, Shettleston, uh, Rakesi, um, wonderful places in their own right, but they do impose certain biological rigour. Um, by... By coincidence, we've just come to the end of a year of celebrations of the half century of the formation of the Centre for Rheumatic Diseases. This is the Beard Street Hospital. This is now the outside lane on the M8 at Townhead Interchange, um, but which is, some would say, actually a better use of it, if, if truth be told. We migrated about 25 or 30 years ago from Beard Street into Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And here you see Watson Buchanan, who 50 years ago was the first professor of rheumatology in Glasgow. Um, an expert in Sjogren's syndrome. And here are a number of photographs depicting over the years, and particularly I wanted to mention Roger Sturrock and Hilary Capel. You see me hiding in the background here as a very junior doctor. But Hilary and Roger taught me about the importance of medicine driven curiosity. And this, by the way, is Roger and Hilary with um, Prince Philip in, in younger years. And I think this is one of the Glasgow patients asking him to come in for a swim in our brand new hydrotherapy pool. Repute um, uh, folklore, I has, have to say, says that that, that offer was declined. But, um, and finally, the real reason for, for driving forward this notion, this is from the Glasgow Herald. Um, and Watson Buchanan, you can see this lovely quotation from the Glasgow Herald in the mid-60s. First of all, a nurse was quoted... So, in fact, it turns out that nurses and doctors and patients worked together for the last half century in the care of dermatic diseases. It always has been a team game, and it remains as such. Secondly, um, nurses were encouraged to ask questions, and that was at the very core of the Centre for Rheumatic Diseases' existence, and I learned that from a very early stage as a physician. Always ask questions. And when you think about the witchcraft that pervaded rheumatological practice, the injection of gold and penicillamine as metal chelators, sulfasalazine, vaguely chosen because of its antibiotic properties in the gut, maybe prescient as things turned out, but not used for any of the right reasons. And the final thing that I rather like about this is that they were encouraged by the chief Watson Buchanan, I have to tell you that at no time am I ever afforded the, um, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the real privilege of being called the chief in Glasgow now, the, the junior doctors rule all. So, in, in lectures of this nature, I, I shall reflect first of all on the past. And uh, what I've elected to do is to take this almost at two different levels. I am, and I hope you'll forgive me for this, I am going to show you one or two of our original raw immunological data sets. Go easy on me. They're actually fascinating if you're an immunologist. If you're not, they're quite colourful and we'll pass the time for a, for a few moments. And then I will, in the, in the second part of my lecture, look to the future and I'm especially going to put Scotland and all that I think many of us in this Royal Society hold very dear, the integrated Scottish collaborative culture at the very fore of what I believe are going to be the next massive steps forward in our diseases. So let me first of all very briefly introduce to you the concept of rheumatoid arthritis, a disease that I've pretty much spent my life studying. And this is a, a paper that is only 25 to 30 years old, written by, by Debbie 
Simmons and David Scott, both now retired, but I can assure you, quite wonderful physicians. And they conclude at the end of this 20-year follow-up of people with rheumatoid, as I was still at medical school at the time. Um, in fact, I used to say, say I was still at high school at the time, but there are enough people in the room know me to know that that's not true. But the, the, the concept of remission-inducing drugs is fallacious. Early treatment may be advantageous, but the prognosis of RA is not good. So that was the starting point. And this is the picture that we teach uh, we, the medical students about rheumatoid arthritis. We have so-called early disease, which the immunologists will fall about laughing because this occurs probably five to ten years after the original immunological sin, the original dysregulation of the immune system, which leads to the events that eventually transpire in the clinic as painful, swollen, and as you can see as time goes by, grossly damaged joints and damage is going to be a major theme for me today and I'll explain to you why. In the subsequent five or ten years to Debbie and David Scott's seminal article, we came to understand of rheumatoid as a syndrome. This is something, and time precludes me telling you about the work we've done in Glasgow in this area, but we're very interested in the idea of rheumatoid as a syndrome. People will die between five and ten years early of vascular disease, higher rates of stroke, they're more likely to develop lung cancer, for example, and they're more likely to die of sepsis. So rheumatoid arthritis carries not only functional loss, but also loss of life expectancy. So the, the, the penalty for developing painful swollen joints is onerous indeed on the people whom I have the privilege to look after. And one of the things we've learned in the last decade, we've actually had a fabulous decade. We have a fabulous decade, which I hope begets another fabulous decade, because we need to do better still. But in the last 10 years, we have learned to treat, to reduce inflammation, to reduce damage. And by so doing, we have reduced the numbers of strokes and heart attacks. We have reduced the amount of bone damage, systemic bone loss, so-called osteoporosis, fracture risk, cognitive function, the progressive loss of ability to communicate effectively, actually, with oneself and with one's, one's family and, and peers. We're beginning to employ people with rheumatoid, but on average, people who develop rheumatoid will not be in their employment within three years of onset of disease, a disease that can onset from teens through to later years. It is an economic disaster for the individual and for the society as a whole. And this was our response to this truly dreadful disease. Um, Willowbark, over a century and a half, evolving to the evolution of steroids in the Mayo Clinic with Hensch's Nobel Prize, given accordingly. And then another 50 years went by when we treated rheumatoid patients with toxic glucocorticoids because in the doses we use them at, they are toxic to achieve the effects that we require to in our patients. And drugs such as injected gold, penicillamine, sulfasalazine, a whole litany of really rather toxic compounds. And when I started out in rheumatology, I spent a lot of time explaining to people how I was going to try and avoid damage on the basis of the medicines that I was giving them. And there, that actually has had a very interesting consequence because people who went into rheumatology, present company accepted, were by and large very nice people because they were clinicians who were committing themselves to 30 years of interaction with people with actually no effective available therapeutics. And that, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, is quite a journey. And those of us in rheumatology deeply admire our patients as a result. And then the big revolution of 15 years ago was the discovery, and this is Ehrlich in his office in Berlin. Well worth a visit. if ever. This was before the laptop days, as you can see. Um, I am told by Gert Burmester, who is my opposite number in the charity in Berlin, that Ehrlich knew where every paper was, and I believe everything Gert tells me. But the, I don't know if that constitutes evidence or not. But of course, what Ehrlich predicted in those very early days a century ago was that the immune system would make antibodies which would very specifically target. And his idea was, of course, that they would target microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and the rest. From that came the revolution that we could capitalize on the immune system's ability to make antibodies, to make antibodies against targets of our own selection. And the real advance was antibodies against TNF, tumor necrosis factor, misnamed because, in fact, it is one of the central inflammatory modifiers in the human immune system. And from that seminal discovery made by Mark Feldman and Tiny Maney came the idea that there were a number of different inflammatory proteins, TNF and IL-6. I need you to remember only two tonight plus one other for extras. 
But if you're asked at dinner tonight, what did you learn? I'd like you to say, well, I learned all about TNF and IL-6. You'll sound very erudite with your dinner party friends. They'll all nod knowledgeably and say, yes, very important cytokines. Cytokines being the proteins that allow leukocytes to talk to each other. And it turned out that we could either block these inflammatory proteins or we could go after the fundamental cells that regulate the immune system, so-called T cells, B cells, and macrophages. And people did very well in these. About 20% of people became 70% better. One-fifth of our target population improved significantly, which actually, when you stop and think about it, isn't actually quite such a triumph. And this is a little... I call this the Smolin Tartan because it's written by my very dear friend, Joseph Smolin, who works in Vienna. And Joseph wrote an article in which he depicts methotrexate-naive patients at the earliest rheumatoid stage, moving through their journey eventually to people who've received TNF-blocking drugs, our best in class, if you like, the best drugs we have available, in fact. And you can see, if you look at someone, and this will take about five years on average in a disease that could last 35 or 40 years, and you will see that those patients who have already failed their first TNF blocker, the orange tells you that around 20 to 50% of them will respond at all the dark orange will tell you that less than 10% will actually respond with any degree of magnitude. In other words, an enormous amount of work to do. And what did we learn in this journey? Well, we've learned, first of all, that the immune system will yield targets for those of us in the business of treating inflammatory disease. But what we forgot, of course, was that the immune system is not developed for the gratification of rheumatologists or even, God forbid, gastroenterologists or even worse than that, dermatologists, um, Rona. But, in fact, the immune system evolved for host defense. It evolved over many, many millennia to protect us from the various microbes that assault us. And this is actually, just as a, as a, as an, as a side um, comment, this is a, a journey to which we are now returning. And Paul Garside, who's in the audience, who's my um, very dear friend and colleague and who leads immunology now in Glasgow, this is, this is us actually in Malawi, down in Blantyre, just around here on the map, looking now to start to develop once again our interest in the non-communicable disease burden that afflicts people who are starting to recover from infectious disease but are sorely burdened now by the diseases of the so-called Western world as their immune system diverts itself back to what it's been doing in our society for many, many centuries, which is attacking our own tissues. The immune <laughs> system is normally designed to adapt so this, for example, is sleeping sickness, I believe. This is a trypanosome. Trypanosome is a parasite which has evolved the capacity to change its coat every few hours or days. And by changing its coat, it becomes harder for the immune system to recognize. Um, just to keep this simple for rheumatologists, there's a green coat and a blue coat. These, of course, have their own molecular characteristics. And this, of course, takes us through the whole idea of an immune system that adapts over time, an immune system that over time will be able to change such that it can see a trypanosome in one coat on day one and a different coat by day seven. That adaptation, and this, by the way, we may not know, but these very early um, species have immune systems. Everybody has immune system. Even a single-cell organism devotes some of its genetic activity to immune defense. This, by the way, is the highest form of the evolutionary tree, the Scotland <laughs> football supporter. I always like to mention that because it is a species of great resilience and therefore must have very highly developed um, host defense. And so we've started to write and study extensively the role of the adaptive immune response. That is an immune response that changes over time. And to try and get away from the idea that an immune response in established arthritis is the same as the immune response at the very beginning of disease. That, when you stop and think about it, is quite implausible. And yet that is the model upon which all drug development is currently taken forward across the entire spectrum of inflammation medicine. And guess what? We're failing. And what I'm going to lay out for you just in a few minutes is an alternate view of how we might take on that adaptation over time, the immunological imperative to adapt so that we can survive as a species. And the two things that will therefore change here very early on in disease, we may have the opportunity to prevent and then once the disease is established, damage will take over. Now, why do I say that? Well, what is this little graph? Let me just explain it to you a bit more detail. This is a graph which depicts the amount of damage on x-rays, and you saw that consequence in my very first picture. Over time, and you can see that the delay in therapy, even, and this depicts it could be three months or six months, it wouldn't need to be much more, 
And you'll see here that the amount of progression of disease is greater if we delay therapy than if we start earlier. The, the rate of progression is greater. It's not just that you start worse off and carry on in a line. The rate of progression is greater. Now, why is that? Well, we have argued for many years that that is because the damage that is done sets the immunological thermostat in our patients to an elevated temperature such that we can never regulate properly. So the amount of damage that is there at the outset will continue to accelerate the progression of the disease. Now, if you're sitting very comfortably, and I do hope you are, and you like a five-minute moment of somnolence, this would be an optimal five minutes, unless, unless you particularly like cellular biology. But I thought, um, I, and again, I wasn't entirely certain what was appropriate for a lecture of this nature, but I thought showing you a couple of figures from my PhD was a good start. It's authentic data, if nothing else. So here were a couple of things we discovered, and up here, these little red dots are a protein called interleukin-15, which occupied a very great deal of my cerebral activity for the first three or four years of my research career. And interleukin-15 was a very interesting molecule. We found it by a whole variety of different molecular methods, whether we looked at the RNA, at the protein, or at a variety of cellular expression profiles. And if you look at the right-hand side of this picture, you'll see two cells, a T cell, which is the, the fundamental regulator of the immune system, talking to a macrophage, which is one of the fundamental doers of the immune system. If you think about the McInnes household, this would be Mrs. McInnes and this would be um, Mr. McInnes, i.e. self-employed. And down here somewhere would be, would be Oliver the dog, who actually does most of the hard work on my behalf. And what we had actually accidentally discovered in my PhD was that T cells and macrophages talk to each other in perpetuity, and they do so through, uh, for those of you who are interested in the biology of cells, uh, extracellular and membrane C-type lectins. So we went away and spoke to some nice people in, um, in GenMab in Copenhagen who had an antibody against IL-15, and we did a clinical trial. We actually did two trials. And in the first trial, we found that around 60% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, when we injected an antibody against interleukin-15, actually improved quite significantly. And these numbers are, broadly speaking, what we saw with TNF blockers, which went on to become blockbusters. And then when we did a phase 2A dose finding study, we actually similarly were able to differentiate the active drug from placebo. There was a little foible in this study. And on such things, I learned a lot from this trial. At week 14, which was the primary outcome measure of our trial, we just missed the outcome. And a very nice man in a center that I shan't name had told all of his patients that if they didn't feel better at week 14, the trial would fail. So everybody felt better at week 14, funnily enough, in that center. <laughs> Funnily enough, not many of them felt very well at week 12 or week 16. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, we put IL-15 not on the shelf, and I'm very delighted to say that we have another program developing, and this will eventually see the light of clinical day. But that was enough to persuade me that understanding how macrophages and the cytokines that macrophages release might be important in rheumatoid arthritis. And what followed in the next decade were a series of experiments, which you will be delighted to know I really have summarized in a very short period of time. A series of experiments which spoke to the multiplicity of pathways which activate macrophages, the central workhorse of the immune system at the very center of the joint. So here on the right-hand side, I'm depicting a T cell talking to a macrophage through these lectins. Immune complexes, damaged tissue, and proteases turn out to be the other pathways. Let me show you, for example, work in which we were able to identify that macrophages sit inside a damaged tissue and sense the presence of, amongst other things, trypsin, matriptase, chymotrypsin, common matrix-destructive enzymes, and actually, rather ingeniously, the immune system senses the presence of these enzymes. It senses the presence of tissue damage all the time and the mediators of that damage. Why? Because the immune system must be constantly aware of what is ongoing and has to have that capacity to adapt over minutes and hours and, of course, in chronic disease, weeks, months and years. And what we were able to show, so if you look at the top left-hand corner, Immunobiology is actually very visible. It's a very colorful discipline. And these brown cells are cells that have protease-activated receptor 2. And the clue is in the name. It's protease-activated. So, in fact, this is an enzyme-activated receptor. And when you inhibit it, 
And I actually recently showed this slide in Australia, and apologies for that, it's there for upside down and back to front. But here in the ENMD is an inhibitor of PAR2, and in little concentrations through to higher concentrations, when we added it to cultured tissue from patients with rheumatoid, we very remarkably reduced the amount of TNF in another cytokine IL-1. In other words, we had the proof of concept that we could inhibit PAR2 and reduce cytokine production. If you like, providing validation that this might be a way in which matrix and macrophages talk to each other a way of sensing damage, a way of understanding why people perpetuate their disease. And what is this down here? And this is especially for Professor Seckel. Um, I don't really understand oxysterols, but happily he does. And when I got into trouble, we were doing a, an experiment which was actually very challenging for me. I asked Lucy Valentine, one of the PhD students in the laboratory, to take cells from the patient's joint and cells from the patient's blood, macrophages both, and a very simple experiment, Lucy, I want you to purify RNA from both of those cell types. I want you to sequence them and tell me what's different. Then, because we'll know what's different in the RNA, we'll know what the cells are doing that's different. Straightforward, Lucy, two years later, Lucy was still trying to do the experiment. Now, Lucy, by then, had lost a lot of weight. She was a smashing lass, and she wasn't big to start with. So... <laughs> Lucy, it turned out, eventually cracked the problem, and it turns out to be very difficult to RNA out of these cells. And thank heavens for this, whether you use this kind of direct two-by-two -two comparison or whether you do a principal component analysis, the blue synovial macrophages were different from the red blood macrophages. Thank heavens. Then you can go and ask questions about what's different, and the computer will tell you what the likely pathways are. And this was the answer. This was a profoundly depressing answer for me, because this required me to start understanding nuclear receptors. And I didn't understand nuclear receptors. And I made a decision that we weren't going to go any further with this particular line of thinking. Fortunately, Darren Asquith, another wonderful PhD student in the lab who ignores signs all the time, also ignored his supervisor and carried on. And we identified particularly this little guy down here, the LXR alpha receptor of great interest to cholesterol biologists around that time six or seven years ago as a potential therapeutic target for cholesterol lowering. But we became very interested in its role in inflammation perpetuation and very counter to what we expected. When we put on the left-hand side an agonist to LXR-alpha, here were some mice developing arthritis, doing nobody else any harm in the clear boxes. And here when we put an agonist in, the severity of disease was dramatically increased. And in the right-hand side, when we took monocytes or in the black bars macrophages from people with rheumatoid arthritis, I do hate the word patients. It so depersonalizes people. So from people with rheumatoid arthritis, you'll see that when we added a little LPS, which switches these cells on, and a little of this agonist of the LXR-alpha pathway, we dramatically increased the amount of TNF and many other cytokines that were being released. So once again, a summary of what we had discovered over many years of investigation. T cells talk to macrophages. Damaged products talk to macrophages. Proteases, sensing the environment, talking to macrophages and products of cholesterol metabolism, talking to macrophages. And finally, to, to conclude this, if you like, discovery part of the science, um, the, we, we became interested in petunias and C. elegans, a shy worm. He will reappear presently thanks to the wonders of the IT department who put him in a loop. But there we are. Um, what we were, became interested in were so-called microRNAs, and these are 22 base pair microRNAs that bind to your conventional messenger RNA in the cytoplasm of all of our cells. Now, these are very interesting molecules because they have the capacity to coordinate the expression of many different proteins at the same time in a cell. They are the molecular equivalent of FedEx, the antithesis of British Airways baggage handling, <laughs> because microarrays will get everything where they're meant to be at the same time. British Airways, on the other hand, will send your bag to Abu Dhabi just as you board the flight to Edinburgh. So microarrays, and it turned out that a rather large number of microarrays were also present in the cells of our patients from rheumatoid. And I, I, again, as a very brief summary to an enormous amount of work that Mariola across the Stolarska has led in Glasgow. These yellow cells are macrophages, once again, in the synovial membrane of people with rheumatoid arthritis, the lining layer. And you can see that actually there's a lot of 155 in there. And when we put lots of 155 as an agamir in, again with this little non-specific LPS stimulus, lots of cytokine being produced. And when we knock it out in the red triangles, not very much arthritis in mice. So, just around this time, 155 started to look like a very interesting target to us. But 
A cautionary note, I live in Glasgow and am in possession of West of Scotland jeans, probably happily diluted with the odd bit of East Coast jeans on my father's side, so I may yet be safe. But you'll see that we were at that time very interested with Navid Sattar, the professor of metabolic medicine in Glasgow, in the remarkable similarities between the joint and their atherosclerotic plaque, ruptured plaque. And so, from a very early stage, Navid and I became interested in the idea that the same proteins that drove inflammation in the joint may also be driving inflammation in the blood vessels, and so it has proven. And in fact, time precludes me showing you the data, but we've now shown in the last decade that when one has onset of an autoimmune disease for that matter, but rheumatoid was our exemplar and is the disease that we've studied in most detail, it turns out that you remarkably accelerate vascular disease. And so we fed our microRNA 155 knockout mouse a Glasgow diet, a high fat diet. And you do not need to be a hepatologist to recognize that this liver here, the bottom right hand corner, which does not have 155 analogous to using it as a therapeutic target, when you feed it the Glaswegian diet, very bad things happen. And you see all these big orange globules of fat inside the liver, and this is the condition of hepatosteatosis. And so, in fact, as has so often been my laboratory experience, the best laid plans were indeed gang after glee. And I've rarely read the next line of this poem, but I had caused to a number of weeks ago for purposes of another lecture. And had I but read on... Um, and Leah's not but grief and pain for promised joy. And I have to say, therein, in two lines of a fabulous poem, lies the life of many a life scientist who has been in pursuit of targets. So, let me turn with that rather checkered history, but the elaboration of many of the pathways that actually turn out to explain chronicity to what I think is going to be the rational choice of targets in future. So the first observation is that um, once we enjoyed the great success of TNF blockade and rheumatoid arthritis, it turned out that we could use these immune targeting antibodies in a number of different inflammatory diseases. My own particular interest has been in leading several global programs targeting psoriatic arthritis, and we've enjoyed some considerable success in this area in the last two or three years especially. And I'm very proud of the fact that in Glasgow we brought two new modes of action into the clinic with licensed approved medicines for the treatment of that disease. But that is another day's story. It serves only to remind us that if we think of all of these diseases as being the same, we will fall afoul of the biological truth. Um, Professor Seckel was wise enough to remark that the skin and joints are different, Ian, as we chatted over a cup of chamomile before we came in. And it turns out that the gut is different from the skin, is different from the eye, is different from the joints. And should we therefore be surprised that the immunological responses mounted in these different tissues also turn out to be just a little different? The immune system has had many eons of evolution to work this out, and that is indeed what has happened. And now we know from therapeutics that these, and the numbers matter a lot less than the concept that we can separate these different diseases on a molecular basis rather than a clinical gestalt. What do I have, doctor? Well, I would say with my great expertise and learnedness that you must have inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, delete as appropriate. What I'd really rather be able to do is say to you, you have molecular diagnosis A, B, or C. And that will therefore predispose you to effective therapeutics D, E, and F. So if we're going to maintain progress, ladies and gentlemen, i.e. if, if this, the status quo, the expectation on the part of society that we will continue to evolve remarkable new things for the people with these dreadful diseases, we're going to have to change because we cannot afford to lose the number of phase three programs that we are currently losing. And this is, the, if you like, the, the, the seminal paper that Garrett Fitzgerald published now almost a decade ago in which he defined a translational model which took us through to target selection in a very linear way. A whole series of events had to occur before we got to a therapeutic target. Now, let me just, we could pick almost any level of this discovery map apart, but let me just take a mouse model, for example. So here was a paper published in the PNAS of the United States of America, a very eminent journal indeed, in which the title, Genomic Responses in Mouse Models Poorly Mimic 
human inflammatory diseases. I met this with great happiness. I'm not a big animal model of disease fan. We do use animal models for mechanism, but not as diseases. I was therefore dismayed in the same journal two years later to read the following paper. Um, that genomic responses in mouse models greatly mimic human inflammatory diseases. I was even more distressed, ladies and gentlemen, to learn that it was the same data set that had been analyzed. There's a problem. So I'm going to tell you about three initiatives and then I shall close to the chair. Um, three initiatives that we have embarked upon in Scotland. The first is a rather Glaswegian effort, but everything from there on in, I can tell you, is pan-Scotland, of which we're very, very proud. But the first, and I'm delighted that Carl is in the audience. This is Carl Goodyear, who's the director, and, and Rose Makovic, who's the AstraZeneca equivalent. Um, so, so many Pangalos and Pascal Soiro, respectively deputy and CEO of AstraZeneca, and I were having a cup of tea a few years ago, and we were thinking a little bit about how a, a wonderful company like AstraZeneca, with remarkable riches and many information technology capacities, libraries of many millions of drugs, how do we best allow them to make advances in human inflammatory diseases? And we are concurred that there were great strengths in pharma and great strengths in academia, and the relationship between the two was not perfect. Now, it is not a relationship that is broken. It's very easy to say that the relationship... I actually don't believe that's true. And I think we actually have numerous relationships between pharma and academia, especially in the United Kingdom, which are very um, much to be admired. But they haven't yet delivered the knowledge gap that we have to traverse. So we've, we, we've set up something called Glasgow Discovery. Please forgive the pun. But what Glasgow Discovery does is to bring academic members of staff in Glasgow, funded entirely by AstraZeneca, in a two-way street. So academics from Glasgow will go to Molendal in Sweden, and academics from, and we call them academics, but the AstraZeneca scientists from Molendal will come to Glasgow. We've given them bodyguards and the paratroopers, and they feel very safe in Glasgow now. And actually, they're big Swedish people, so they shouldn't be scared in the first place. And there's been a remarkable exchange of knowledge, and I hope very much that with Carl's leadership that we will see new products coming from that very soon indeed. I can tell you that the company thus far are very happy. The second major advance that I want to tell you about, which is the beginning of, if you like, my next best guess at the future, is the formation of the Rheumatoid Arthritis Centre of Excellence, funded very generously by Arthritis Research UK, uh, with a, a, a wonderful collaboration between my dear friends um, in, in Birmingham and Newcastle. And this is a centre um, and you're seeing here images generated in the laboratory of Professor Paul Garside, also in the, the audience. Paul is a, a very remarkable biologist who has actually furnished us with the capacity to look at the immune system moving in vivo in real time uh, in such a way that we can actually, instead of doing test tube experiments, we can actually ask questions about what really happens over time in human, uh, uh, humanized mice or in mice. And we hope eventually, if Paul will allow me, in humans we have that up and running and shortly we'll be imaging humans uh, of the Glaswegian variety. And, and the, the center has two objectives. First of all, to understand what the fundamental immunological error is. Why is it that the immune system, instead of tolerating our joints, responds to our joints? It's in the name, breach of tolerance. And if we could understand that, because we can find these people up to 10 years before the onset of disease, immunological perturbation would become hypertension. Rheumatoid arthritis would become the stroke. And by treating the immunologic hypertension, we could prevent the immunological stroke that I and many others now believe rheumatoid to be. What an interesting concept, preventing rheumatoid arthritis. And yet we can have that quite coherently in 2016 without anyone actually laughing at us. And the second, and this is terribly important, and the reason I emphasize chronicity today is that there are in the world tens of millions of people who have rheumatoid arthritis. And for them, prevention is way too late. And so on their behalf, we continue to work very hard at understanding why the disease is perpetuated. And the center works on my own cell of preference, the myeloid lineage, but also stromal cells, fibroblasts, and stem cells. And we bring a systems-based approach. So here's a model, for example, that we're just about to um, publish in The Lancet, where we have this pre-arthritis phase, which is all about genetics and smoking and altered gut microbiome, the microbial products within our gut and probably mouth and lungs, coming together to create the immunologic emergency, which eventually becomes this, a very low-grade cellular and then high-grade inflammatory infiltrate. And at each of these stages, we're looking for the causative factors. 
Now, the original idea that Mark Feldman and Tiny Mary had, remember, was that there is one molecule, TNF-alpha, which sits at such a pivotal place in the immune response that if you block it, the disease will be switched off. Beautiful idea. And that they captured in the original cell paper. Now, I want some of you to think about the immunological challenge that a single pathway poses for evolution. Because my guess is that it would take a well-trained virus about half an hour to work out how to stop the Glasgow Underground. You need to have flooding at George Cross. Flooding at George Cross closes the entire Glasgow Underground in both directions. It's quite remarkable. The problem with an immune system that evolves around a single molecule is that it is too easy to beat. And remember I said we've forgotten about the immune system's day job, which is to defend us. And actually, if we look in the joint, and to my shame, I have actually stained for and detected every single one of those cytokines and rheumatoid tissues in my lab over the last 20 years. There's lots of them there. And our, our, our best guess for the next step, and I've started to hire mathematicians and systems biologists. And I don't really understand them very well. We're learning to speak to each other gently, slowly, in Serbo-Croat, and we're coming together. Eventually, we will understand each other well enough to do, we hope, some meaningful systems science. But this was the original paper that Mark published in Cell. The immune system makes TNF makes all of these guys. I've indicated to you that probably doesn't work, but this is our new working model that we built out of the systematic approach we're taking in the ER UK Centre. So our idea is that there will be groups of inflammatory proteins, and here they are. The names matter less than the concept, which is that they are designed to work together. So if you have a gram-negative <coughs> infection, E. coli infection, septicemia, taking you into intensive care, these are the cytokines that must work together. They're designed to work together. They're trained and evolved to work together. <laughs> now, if you imagine now in the bottom left-hand corner that you have developed rheumatoid arthritis, the causative factors driving rheumatoid are different from gram-negative sepsis. And therefore, it is not unreasonable to suppose that actually different parts of the immunological team will come together. And that is what we depict here. This grey so-called disease module that the systems biologists tell us will actually lead to new targets. Because once we understand this and this and this, we could go back and identify that in silico. And that is the whole power of the mathematical biological molecule. You understand things that you didn't know before you started because you map onto the maths what you already know. And by the way, psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis are different. But we knew that already because Jonathan told us so. And the final development that we have going, and I'm really proud of this here in Scotland, is the promise of personalised medicine. Because the concept, if you've come with me so far, that we can take the molecular lesion in the joint in the skin for that matter, take the same technology, the same mathematical systems approach to the detection of molecules. It's actually quite easy to detect most many molecules nowadays. The real problem is to work out what you do with them once you've found them. That's actually a real challenge. So personalized medicine, I'm imagining most people are familiar with. At the moment, when I prescribe, I give to people who have many different molecular flavors of the same roughly similar disease. What I'd like to do is to separate them into the molecular subtypes, so-called endotypes of disease, and then give them the appropriate colored therapeutic. And if I do that, responses will be enriched. And funders will pay large money for a guaranteed response. So it becomes economically viable as well. And with the advances in data science, which I do not understand but employ people who do, it then becomes possible to take those molecules together. So let me give you two examples, and then I shall close. The first example is a, what should be a very obvious question. I told you that we had several different biological molecules that we use to treat early rheumatoid arthritis. One of them are these TNF blockers. But the other is a, a drug we borrowed from lymphoma literature, rituximab. It wipes out all of your B lymphocytes, which are the cells that make antibodies, it turns out. So we've asked a very simple question in, in, uh, in a study called the ORBIT trial, which is, again, just coming out next week in The Lancet. And we asked a very simple question, if we give a TNF blocker or a B-cell depleting molecule, which is better? And all the money was in the TNF blockers. We did a non-inferiority study because we're scared. And it turned out that there was no difference between the two strategies. That was surprise number one. Surprise number two is if there was any preference at all, it was actually for the cellular and not the cytokine therapy. 
And then because um, Duncan Porter, my very dear friend and colleague in Glasgow, is parsimonious in the extreme, we did a health economic analysis as part of the primary evaluation of the trial. And the columns you're seeing here is it costs 10,000 or so pounds for the actual infusion, 8,000 for rituximab, and you will save roughly two to 3,000 pounds per patient were you to choose the B-cell depleting agent first. Ah, I hear you say, but then there'll be some people who could have benefited from the other approach. And that's where we bring the personalized medicine approach. So we looked in detail, we sequenced the RNA of the blood of all of the patients and all of the uh, recruits, in fact. And we were able to use the, the, this kind of area under the curve and you can work out that roughly 85% of the variants can now be explained on a gene set plus two clinical covariates. Turned out we need to know whether you're male or female and what age you are. Most people, even in Glasgow, can manage that. So maybe not the age, but certainly gender allocation is not a problem. And then we validated this, and we're roughly around the 90% mark, and that turns out to be economically viable. And finally, to Scotland, the Scottish Early Rheumatoid Arthritis Cohort. And this is a remarkable effort. This is what Scottish biomedicine is really all about. Every NHS rheumatologist in Scotland contributes patients and every time somebody with rheumatoid arthritis or some form first of that comes to the clinic, they're enrolled and registered. Samples are then gathered from these patients and because of the remarkable electronic health record system that we have in Scotland, we can then follow these people theoretically for life. Carl led what is called the nested progression study in which a small select group of patients, around 50 or so, were brought into one or two of the academic centres for really intensive immunological profiling. And when we did that, we discovered some really, really exciting things. The idea is to bring all of these different data sets together, the epigenome, the genome, all the way through to the cellular profile and put that all into one big gamush. And those of you with children will appreciate this particular quotation that I like very much. I only have two girls, and I'm afraid I also completely fail to cope. I have no theories left. But Carl, fortunately, has many theories. And when he looked at this, and you'll see we actually had to look at 14 different white blood cell subsets, including their activation potential for those of you who are life scientists in the room. But this allowed us to separate healthy people from rheumatoid people and healthy rheumatoid, pe uh, uh, rheumatoid people, I should say, who were going to be responders and those who were going to be non-responders. In other words, there actually is an immunological set point that says whether you are or are not in possession of rheumatoid and whether you will subsequently be able to respond to disease. And then you can ask the question, well, if those cells look like that, the genome must be set in such a way that that immune response can be set that way. And to look at the totality of the genetic machinery the, the technique of choice is, is, is epigenetic mapping. And you can do this by looking at the different points. When genes are made up of many different ribbons that can be brought together to make a coding protein. So the ribbons come together. It's a little bit like you give your kid a ribbon and they make a big knot. And the knot will come together. But by knowing which different loops are there, you can eventually identify a rather unique knot, that of your own child. So we've actually looked, and again, this is what with Carl and colleagues down in Oxford, we've created what is really best thought of as the ordnance survey map of the, the blood leukocyte in somebody with early rheumatoid arthritis. And we've asked which of those mountains at which height confers the epigenetic risk of developing rheumatoid. We looked at 123 different genes a hundred of them come from the genome-wide studies of rheumatoid, and the others were just basically our favorite genes. I think there was plenty of bias there, molecules I was interested in and Carl was interested in. And we put them into the great computing bank in the sky that does this epigenetic analysis, and we came out with only five. Truly remarkable, only five genes are those that are required to predict whether you will be a responder or a non-responder to methotrexate with a remarkably high degree of certainty in the order of 90% plus. And that is clinically useful. So now using different varieties of molecular and cellular approaches, we're able to allow the clinician and the informatician and the pharmaceutical company to come together in one place. I think most of you will be familiar with this wonderful quotation. Um, the hardest thing of all is to find a black cat in a dark room, especially if, as is so often the case in the McInnes laboratory, there is no cat. And, and, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to finish where I started, which is with the person with arthritis, and this is a true story. Um, 
a very tall man came into my clinic now five years ago, and he was the first patient to whom I ever gave anti-IL-15 antibody. And he actually was in remission for a year after that single series of injections, and it may or may not have had something to do with the therapeutic we gave him. Nevertheless, he always believed it did. And if you're in good shape with a patient, stay there, general advice. And he came in one day and he said, Professor, um, you've never asked me why I help you with your research. And I said, well, I haven't, of course, because this would prejudice the informed consent. I'm allowed to ask for your consent, but I don't really want to know why, because then I could prejudice you. Oh, I'm going to tell you anyway. And as you know, if a big man in Glasgow is going to tell you something, just say yes. It's a whole lot safer. And, and, and Mr. X um, put a photograph down on my desk in Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And uh, this was the photograph that he put down. And he put his own hand next to the photograph. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I want you to promise me, Professor, that this will never happen to that. Out of the mouth of a man in the east end of Glasgow, a very simple man, a very wonderful man, came the ultimate challenge for us. And the reason we're doing systems medicine in Glasgow and around Scotland, and the reason the Scottish rheumatology community are so extraordinarily brilliantly coming together to create the data that we will crunch and we will use to find the cure for these diseases in years to come. I, I, we didn't used to use the cure word in rheumatology. We were a chronic discipline and we should be proud of it. But I think we're changing. We're changing happily to an idea where we can begin to dream big. And it is interesting, isn't it, that the other word that has its derivation in curiosis is in fact, as one would anticipate, cure. I've spoken about much work done by many, little of it done by me. And therefore, I wanted to show a few photographs and names. I won't read them all for you. Um, Carl and Paul are in the room, and Duncan has led many of the clinical trials. Eddie Liu was my PhD supervisor. Navid has been my partner in many crimes in the vascular inflammation field. This is the ERUK Centre of Excellence at one of our regular meetings, this case down in Birmingham, and this is my own laboratory group. The PhD students live well in Glasgow. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. <laughs> So thank you very much for a really inspiring talk. We have opportunity now for some questions or comments. Uh, we're a big grouping, so can I ask that you wait for a microphone to come to you? So if you'd like to ask a question, put up your hand. I'll direct microphones around the room. When you get a microphone, please hold it fairly close to your mouth. Uh, and it would be useful if you would say who you are, where you're from. Thank you. Have we questions? Anybody dare to be first? Yes. Front, my left. Thank you very much. My question has two aspects to it. Um, sexually acquired reactive arthritis and enterically acquired reactive arthritis. With those terms, am I 25 years out of date? And the other no. question, the other question that is... That was an easy one. Um, <laughs> just how much uh, has research in these two sorts of arthritis driven um, the immunological aspects of uh, rheumatoid arthritis that's research? A, that, that's, a bit, that's a prescient question, I must say. So first of all, a, a little bit of orientation for everyone, lest we become shocked. Um, <coughs> the, there are a number of infectious agents which, when we become infected, will trigger a series of immunological events, which, for reasons that we don't fully understand, end up as an arthritis. And um, happily for those vicars of historical lore who became afflicted with this condition, they can be either gastrointestinally acquired or um, sexually acquired. And the, the reality is that with improved sexual health, and particularly in the last 10 years, with something of a liberation of education, we've seen a lower frequency of these agent, uh, infectious agents across 
the developed world. I'll come to, I'm going to develop the theme just momentarily because it's a very remarkable thought, I have to say, you've provoked the reason we're in Malawi, actually. So the answer is, first of all, yes, those are the correct terminologies. And we've, some of you may have heard of Reiter's syndrome. We've dispel, dispensed with that terminology because of Professor Reiter's association with, um, with, with, with experimentation in Nazi Germany. I, I, I mention that merely to dispense that completely from our, our literature. And the, the whole idea of this is that the immune system has to make a choice. It has to defend us against that infectious challenge for obvious reasons, lest the infection wins. But in so doing, it takes a risk, and the risk is that it will trigger a sequence of immunological events which will culminate in involvement of either arthritis, there are actually a number of skin conditions that can occur as well, and also involvement of the eye, and we see this classic triad of skin or arthritis and, and, and eye disease, which can be very difficult to treat. The second thing is to remember who is often afflicted, and these are young people at the peak of their potential economic power and growth, and they develop this disease, which actually does still have some stigma attached to it, and it can be very, very devastating. The other group who get this are people who've been traveling and come back after their Campylobacter infection as part of the cruise in Mallorca or the, 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 the all-packaged tour of India. That's another favorite when they come off the plane from India and hobble around with a sore ankle or knee for a little while and then work out it might be related. Now, why should I care? Well, so Paul and I are spending quite a lot of our time going in and out of Malawi at the moment, and I must tell you, I'm allowed to tell our little story, yes. So there was, there was Paul and I sitting in a, a, a mission hospital in southern uh, Malawi near Blantyre, and this is all Paul's work, I have to tell you. Um, I'm happy to tell his stories on his behalf. And we were, um, we were a little concerned because the purpose of me as a rheumatologist being there, Paul is a, an immunologist who's interested in tra malaria, amongst other things. So what on earth is a rheumatologist doing in Malawi? Well, we thought there must be arthritis there. And the reason we thought there must be arthritis there was because if you survive HIV or tuberculosis or malaria you are quite likely to have a very reactive immune system. It is an immune system that is predisposed to go on and do bad things to you. So, for example, we see very dramatic psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in HIV survivors in, in the developed world. So it was inconceivable that this would not be the case in Africa, and yet to our dismay, and Paul knows I was beginning to get very pale indeed because I'd invested quite a bit of time and effort and energy and grant funding proposals in saying we're going to sort this problem out in Malawi. Oh, there's no arthritis here. So we asked if there is a word that describes, I'm very sore, my joints don't work and I can't walk. Oh yes, if only you'd asked. That's Nyamakazi. So it turns out, so we then wandered off into the waiting room and says, is there any nyamakazi around as one does in Malawi? And of course all the hands went up. Oh yeah, we've got nyamakazi in the family, but there's a critical problem in Malawi. There's no public transport. If you can't walk, you can't get to the clinic. If you need to go to a clinic, it's because you're about to die of HIV, advanced cancer or malaria or tuberculosis. Having a swollen knee or ankle doesn't cut it. But if you have a swollen knee or ankle, you can neither work nor get to food nor get to water. And in an impoverished society, the rights of the fittest will be extended. So your question is really insightful. First of all, because the mechanisms that link that first infectious sin <coughs> to the mechanisms that drive chronic inflammation in a joint are intensely interesting to us. And we will be starting a program in Malawi where we have a very exaggerated phenotype. This is uh, very interesting because, of course, our friends in Malawi would believe that we are going there to deliver local quality. I have to say that it's not quite so altruistic because the lessons we learn there, we will bring back here because I think there is mechanistic learning which will be bi-directional. So uh, it, it's a great question. It's a current problem. We're getting better at treating it for sure. But the lessons learned, I hope, can be helpful. Well, closer to home is, is Lyme disease, particularly um, Lyme disease is a, is a real challenge. So Lyme disease is a, is a tick-borne uh, infection, Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes a, a reaction against a molecule called LFA3, which sits in the surface of many of our, our, our white blood cells. Um, Lyme disease, of course, is potentially preventable because there if you can treat the infection with penicillin simple cheap safe um, you can actually prevent the subsequent sequence of events that lead to reaction in the skin and the joints and the brain and the heart of people so afflicted um, Lyme disease less common than we think 
but common enough to be worrying about. If you were to go to where it was originally described in, in Connecticut and Old Lyme, it is actually very, really very common. Um, Germany, some of the middle European countries, it's really very common. Um, what I think, it, 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 it's using these um, diseases as models for the, the general path, and that's really what we're about. And that's why we're interested both in work close to home, but also work far away. Other questions? You've explained it all. <laughs> I've stunned you and shocked you yes, to we silence. Have, oh, we have one there. A brave hand appears. <laughs> Hello, I'm a third year medical student here at Edinburgh. Um, and I was wondering, in the age of, well, future when we can genetically test all newborn babies and therefore um, put them into their subclasses of healthy, um, predisposed to arthritis and um, reactive, non-reactive to treatment, does that put a lot of future patients onto lifelong, <clears throat> lifelong treatment that will not ultimately, um, of, of patients that might not even become arthritic, or at what point would you decide to begin treatment, and mm -hmm. is that... That's also a that, that, that's also a great question. There's actually several different questions in there. There's there's an issue about exposing people to harm of therapeutics when they're not ever actually going to develop a disease. There's an issue of how well we can predict the likelihood. Let, let me first of all say for at least, and I can really only speak for what I'll selfishly say are my diseases, the inflammatory rheumatic diseases. So far. We do have a small number of diseases that are single gene mediated and therefore potentially could be detected early in life. Even those require a fair amount of environmental modification for them to really manifest themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'd quite like to know about those because if you know about them young, you can prevent amyloid developing in kidneys and heart and you can save lives. For most of the rest of the inflammatory rheumatic conditions, the genes that contribute, there are at least 100 of them, probably more, it's highly unlikely that we will have a genetic signal mm -hmm. of sufficient risk as to merit any therapeutic intervention. There may be a genetic signal that says, potentially at risk, be careful. There may be other clues, almost certainly there will be other clues, a family history already there of someone who's developed a disease. Now, let's imagine you had cheap screening. You may not treat, but what you might do is screen for early detection. And then there's a whole other area of immune biology which is emerging rapidly and which is actually work that Paul is pr prosecuting in, in, in Glasgow and other immunologists actually here in this fine university as well in Edinburgh, whereby you can actually persuade the immune system to switch off. So everyone I, in the room, I guess, is familiar with the concept of vaccination. The purpose of vaccination is to trigger the immune system to develop a response against a given stimulus. The stimulus could be streptococcus, it could be pneumococcus, it could be the flu. The idea being that once the immune system is activated against that bug, it will respond very, very rapidly in the real event of it being challenged by that bug. Forewarned is forearmed, and that is the purpose of positive vaccination. Well, we now understand that in the immune system, as in so many other realms of life science, there's an on switch and an off switch. And we can now actually design vaccines the consequence of the vaccination is a deliberate off switch rather than a deliberate on switch. So then the concept arises, if we knew which protein or lipid in the body was going to be the trigger, we could vaccinate you for an off response instead of vaccinating you for an on response. So, and that, of course, is a transient therapy. That's not lifelong therapy at all. So thank you. It's a very insightful question again, and it... it it allows me to kind of wax lyrical in the next generation of immune therapeutics, which if we, get our, if we do our job right, we won't need chronic therapy. We'll actually turn chronic diseases into acute diseases. We'll turn common acute diseases into orphans because we'll have parsed them out into their different molecular types. And for each of those smaller segments of disease, we'll have molecule-specific therapeutics. Now, I dare say I might be retired before all of that happens. I don't think my wife will let me, but there we are. So I'll either be carried out in an interesting box or I'll be retired by then. But the, I begin to sound like the Horizon Television BBC. <laughs> the, the, the various technologies and informatic solutions to achieve some of these rather wild conjectures are by and large in place. They're not all in the right place. They're not all aligned. 
And one of the joys of living and working in a country the size of Scotland is that we're big enough to just about have the power to ask these questions, but small enough to talk to each other sufficiently to allow some of the connections yeah. to be made. Excellent. Yes. yes, here. Thank you, Erin. I wondered what the um, up-to-date situation and information is about Guillaume Barre um, and the autoimmune. Mm. Mm. I was advised not to have vaccines because... Because I've of risk. Twice, mm. yeah. Oh, my heavens. Yeah. Um, so Guillaume Barry, uh, again, to bring everyone into the discussion, is a, an immunological reaction that attacks our neurons and particularly attacks the long axons whereby neurons communicate with muscles and sensation. And it's a, it's a ghastly condition because it leads to progressive numbness, progressive inability to move, even in some people culminating in the requirement for ventilation. Mm. And our current therapies are actually really rather poor. We, you would think in this day and age when immunologists like myself put up carefully prepared cartoons of this cell talking nicely to that cell talking to the following cell, that we really understood how those relationships exist in the real world. In fact, we don't. Mm. So Guillaume Barry um, at present is a disease that remains a supportive therapeutic approach. It is, however, a disease that is giving up several of its secrets. So first of all, and again, and it's, it's coincidental that there is no Glaswegian bias at the table tonight, I can absolutely assure you, but one of the, the, the world leaders in the discipline is Hugh Willison working in my institute in Glasgow. And Hugh has um, been particularly wise in trying to identify the structures on nerves that are targeted and attacked in Guillaume-Barré. And it turns out that they're a mixture of lipids and sugars that come together. And Hugh's real insight was to recognize that the immune system could attack these complexes on the surface of nerves. He also then went and looked in the microbial world and found that a number of um, bacteria particularly also share that structure and it's actually the there's a certain um, continuity to our questioning this evening it's this idea of the immune system doing what it must do it makes a decision to defend us mm -hmm. but in so doing in making that decision to defend it progresses to making an immune response which for stochastic reasons allow it to then a target part of our own tissue um, Guillaume Barré I think in a meaningful period of time will give up sufficient numbers of its secrets. We do have the sub parts of the, and the forgive the immunobabble, but it's the humoral response for those of you who are interested in such matters. But the, 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 the way in which the immune system makes antibodies, these antibodies then go and attack the nerves, is actually being increasingly very, very well understood indeed. The problem is that the, the, by the time we work out that somebody is at risk and under threat and the neural paralysis starts, it's too late. So it's another disease that's going to require much earlier recognition, much more aggressive therapeutic intervention. Um, sadly and tragically, there's been a terrific stimulus to Guillain-Barré research in the recent Zika virus calamity that is afflicting people in South America and now I have to say in many other parts of the world there's less noise being made in Africa as is so often the case but it's every bit as big a problem there we now understand and the Zika seems to be triggering an immune response which is rather similar and then will provoke the, the Guillain-Barré syndrome. But in just the same way that we could think of vaccinating people to prevent that happening in autoimmunity well so too you could em eventually imagine a preventative strategy that involved vaccination. The problem is it's quite a bit rarer. And so the risk benefit ratio of going looking for people who might be a risk is actually quite a different equation. And I should qualify all of that by saying I'm not a neurologist. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Erin, gentlemen towards the back. Um, as, a, as a Ouija myself, I um, <laughs> appreciated your use of Glasgow humour to illustrate some very complex ideas. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I also appreciated your um, personalisation of uh, not using the word patient. However, my question, my real question, um, is by chance today I was um, uh, diagnosed as having gout, which everyone laughs at. And um, yeah. I... I, I 
and I don't expect you to answer this in a, any personal kind of way, despite what I've just said, but uh, do you have any comments about the connection between gout and arthritis? Oh, lots. And um, f so first of all, I apologize for the Ouija humor. It's a dreadful affliction. It is actually genetically acquired and there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> um, I've, I've, I've written several grants to the welcome in the hope that we could get some kind of uh, ablative therapy, but n no, no funding is thus far forthcoming. <laughs> Move so, to Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so gout. Um, actually, you, you, and you're also right to make the aside that it is a disease that provokes a humorous response unless one is afflicted. Yeah. It's an excruciating condition. Mm. It's triggered by uric acid crystals that for a whole variety of reasons actually form crystalline. And it's very unusual for crystals to form in the normal pH 7.4, 37 degree human body. So these crystals, it turns out, are recognized by, and if you're ready for this, and I don't know, and it's a sunny evening on Monday, but you can stand one more molecular neologism, the NALP3 inflammasome, which to those of you who are not necessarily molecular immunologists is an extraordinarily brilliant protein structure. And it sits inside, guess what, macrophages and neutrophils. And it has the capacity to very specifically recognize uric acid in crystal form. It also recognizes cholesterol for that matter. Uh -huh. And by recognizing the uric acid crystal, it switches on by and large the same cytokine proteins that I have described to you as being upregulated in people with rheumatoid arthritis. There was a little nuance in there which time and probably your will to live precluded me exploring, but when the TNF blockers were developed in the, 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 the late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a very persuasive biological model that said that IL-1 blockers, interleukin-1 is another inflammatory protein, these IL-1 blockers are going to be better than TNF blockers because TNF and IL-1 look as if they do pretty much the same thing. But, you know, it's a wee bit like saying Henrik Larsson and Ali McCoy are the same beast. They're not. They're actually different. They do roughly the same thing. They score goals now and then, but they're driven by very different sort of substrata, very different supporting infrastructure. And it turns out that gout is exclusively driven by interleukin-1. And that's because the NALP3 inflammasome switches on interleukin-1 in the joints of people with gout. So this has actually been therapeutically applied now, and we have the capacity to use relatively old-fashioned medicines, very effective medicines, steroids. Steroids work very well in early gout. We, we do sometimes use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, willow bark, aspirin, and their modern derivatives. Mm -hmm. But those are actually quite toxic if used for longer periods of time. And now we have the, the, the joy of interleukin-1 blockers, which can be used relatively safely in the long term to control difficult-to-manage gout. And herein lies the irony. The IL-1 blockers were originally developed for single gene disorders because they had failed in rheumatoid. And so the market commanded a very high price. And so the companies who made them took the very high price, thank you very much indeed. So they now have drugs that cost between 50 and 100,000 pounds a year. And nobody is going to treat gout for 100,000 pounds a year. Not even um, the wonderful Scottish Medicines Consortium will allow us to do that. And therefore, we have the great irony of medicines that are highly effective but priced out of the clinical marketplace. Mm. And so there's work for us to do. There's work for us to do in the biology, but there's also work for us to do in the economic microenvironment in which new medicines are developed and new medicines are brought forward. And we need flexibility in the way those medicines can then be adapted and readapted. So to your question, the pathways are s similar but not the same. Similar enough to be amenable to the same biological interventions, but not sufficiently the same for it to be the same biologic drugs. We actually need subtly different drugs. But the principle is absolutely, as I've de 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 um, tried to lay out for you for rheumatoid, <coughs> it's the idea that once we understand the stimulus, in this case, uric acid, of course, for gout, we have the option of lowering uric acid, and that's very cheap and generally very safe and very well tolerated. So the vast majority of gout sufferers, and I hope you, I sincerely hope you're one of them, who will do very, very well on simple uric acid lowering therapies. But if perchance that doesn't work, there are other options available, delighted to see. Thank you, and also in the same row, and this will have to be our last question. I'm a commu community worker from Edinburgh, and I just wanted to know, about the interaction between the environmental and the behavioral, you know, how do you, what, how do you know, because it's multifactorial, how do you balance factors out such as diet, environment, yeah, it's very and genetics? Yeah, um, so um, 
I, I'm a bear of very simple brain. I'm a clinical immunologist who does proof of concept clinical trials. Epidemiology and genetics is far too hard for me. <laughs> um, I, cognizant of time, I'll give you, a, I hope, a reasonably succinct answer. So first of all, you have to look at sufficient numbers of people in the population. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you have to have those people sufficiently characterized to allow you to at least have the chance of seeing something. Mm. And thirdly, you have to have very good control groups and very, very, and, and the better your case definition. So, I mean, one of the problems we had with rheumatoid arthritis in the environment for many years is that pretty much anyone with a sore joint had rheumatoid because they had rheumatism. So for many, many years, we were dealing with the old adage in epidemiology is garbage in, garbage out. So we had a lot of garbage in and I beg to say that possibly quite a lot of the epidemiology 20 odd years ago was not mm. terribly informative. Mm. So now we have very carefully performed case control trials that show unequivocally that smoking is a risk factor. We're pretty sure that silica for rheumatoid is a risk factor. Um, we're reasonably sure that other pulmonary irritants are risk factors. We're not remotely sure that changes in your gut microbiome are risk factors, but everyone in the funding agencies at the moment is telling you that if you look at the microbiome, we'll give you money. So everybody's writing grant applications that say, guess what, the microbiome must be important. But there's a little bit of cart and horse that needs to get organized there, and that's just a personal bias. But the gut microbiome will be part of that risk, but very difficult to tease apart. Um, so th th those, are the, the, those are the ones we know about. Time really does preclude me talking about the impact of socioeconomic status, but that is probably really, really important. Mm -hmm. And I'm slightly embarrassed to discuss it with Professor Seckel in the room in front of me, but he and we and many others have been very interested in why people, particularly from the poorer socioeconomic background in Glasgow and, and Edinburgh and other parts of this great nation, why they do so badly. Mm -hmm. Hilary Capel and I looked at people with rheumatoid arthritis a number of years ago in Glasgow, and we looked at people before and after effective therapy. And the people in the lowest socioeconomic groups after therapy still had more disease activity than the people before therapy in the well-off parts of Glasgow. Mm. Why on earth that is, we have no idea. I mentioned the word epigenetics, and I do so advisedly, but epigenetics, for those of you not in the biological fields, mm. is the process whereby we molecularly change our gene or the gene machinery. We change it at the molecular level to allow us to confer advantage because of the stimulus we're put into. So, you know, if we're in a very difficult, stressful environment, our genes will be modified, ideally to allow us to better cope with that. But if that happens over 20 or 30 or 40 years, that immediate defense becomes a long-term weapon against us. And, and it's harder to do that. You can imagine how difficult it is to track socioeconomic status for chronic diseases. I hope that helps. It's only the beginning of an answer to a good question. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm going to call a halt to the questioning at this point and invite Professor Jonathan Seckel to offer the vote of thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam President and Ian. We have been treated to a tour de force, haven't we, this evening, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Jonathan Seckel. I'm Professor of Medicine at the University of Edinburgh and Vice Principal there and all that sort of thing. But that was remarkable. First of all, a, a word about Sir James Black, in whose uh, name this uh, splendid lecture is given. Um, I was fortunate enough to be taught by him when I was a spotty medical student in the 1970s. Yes, Ian, I am that old. And um, it's a remarkable introduction to meeting somebody of that intellectual capability. He was just about to become a Nobel Prize winner for discovering drugs that worked through receptors. And I was in his uh, seminar group, and he sat me down, and he said, the six of us, he said, right, boy, he said to me, he said, we're going to debate receptor theory for the others. I'm going to be for it, and you're going to be a it. I lost. <laughs> and he got his Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, we have heard something remarkable this evening. The, the median paper in medical research is cited how many times in its entire career? How many times do other re researchers refer to the average paper in medical research? Once. It used to be nonce, but now there's so many papers, they get referred at once. Ian here has 16,000 citations, so we've listened to a real expert. 
And he's taken us through that whole gamut of cures and curiosities in, in arthritis. It's been a privilege to listen to I, what I hope you will agree with me is the chief. <laughs> we've gone through from the history. We've understood it all. But I think what permeated that talk throughout was not the Ouija sense of humor, amusing though it is, but compassion. We've listened to an academic clinician at the very top of his game, but permeating right the way through was compassion. Compassion for the sufferer, compassion for the patient, compassion for the person with this dread disease. And I think that was very powerful. We've had an entire alphabet soup of molecules. I noted them down for you just to remind you, and by the way, there will be a test. <laughs> PAR2, tryptase, TNF-alpha, IL-1, 6, 10, and 15. It's almost, it's almost like a sermon, really, isn't it? We know about MER-155, and we also know that British Airways needs MER-155 to keep our luggage on the right track. We've listened to poetry. We've listened to everything. We know about the hierarchy from the rheumatologist at the top through the gastroenterologist to the dermatologist, I'm afraid I'm an endocrinologist, so I'm much lower down than all of that. And we've even heard about how highly evolved the Scotland football fan is. No, in seriousness, we have listened to a visionary thinker, somebody who can synthesize vast tracts of the literature and then think beyond it. Somebody who is driven by a understanding of the need for personalized medicine, that a diagnosis is only the beginning of the pathway. Somebody who is driven to use all of the new computational, numeric, and systems processes that will make sense of that alphabet soup and all of the other pieces of information that we have. We've listened to what is the quintessential academic physician, from Edinburgh, my view is we should clone him. <laughs> so, to misquote the great bard, the best laid plans of McInnes's man, no gang after Glay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Seckel, and thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, I'm going to close the meeting. If you are interested in attending any of the other events here, do please talk to one of our staff out in the hallway. And thank you. Good evening.